Well, uh, thank you for tuning in to listening to this lecture. Uh, my name is Karin Oberg, and as the title suggests, I will be talking about gas and chemistry in protoplanetary disks. But for those of you who know my background, you will not be surprised that I will be spending more time on the second part of that, on the chemistry, but we will also um, be going over what we know observationally uh, about gas in disks and actually mostly why we don't know more uh, than we do. So protoplanetary disks, the birthplace of planets, are complicated because there's so many things that are interacting with one another. The structure, the dynamics, uh, and that's both the gas and the dust, and the, their structures and dynamics are decoupled. Uh, and the chemistry all are all linked and act and interact with one another in different ways. And uh, we'll be going through, the, we'll be coming back to this uh, cartoon a couple of times in, in this talk, but just to guide you. So as we go closer to the star, it gets hotter as you, as you would uh, probably guess. As we get towards the surface of these disks, it gets hotter, which means that the midplane of the disk is the coldest part. The midplane is where planets form. So if we care about the composition, for example, of the gas and the dust, we're gonna uh, care about it in the midplane. Uh, dust, as it grows, settles down to the midplane. So you'll get some vertical segregation between dust and, and gas. Uh, also pebbles, they drift inwards. So you'll get some radial segregation between what the gas and the dust uh, is doing. Uh, there are a couple of things that's going on that's gonna change the gas and the dust composition. One is just sublimation and condensation. And this happens because there are places in the disk that's too warm for, let's say, water to remain icy. So you get the sublimation front or a snow line or ice line. And the same is true for other volatiles as well. Um, there's also turbulence, we think, in disks to how much is contested, which can mix what's going on at different disk layers and also uh, in, the, in the radial uh, dimension. So there are multiple ways to sort of transport uh, uh, the composition of both the grains and the gas from one part of the disk to, to another, which, which is important. Uh, and these disks are also uh, where a lot of chemistry happens that changes the composition of both the gas and the grains. Uh, perhaps the most important one is that um, mediated by UV photons, which is going to be uh, the most active closer to the surface of the disk. And then the question is how much of that sort of surface layer and how deep into the disk that surface layer uh, sort of goes, and then how much you can mix what's going on with the different vertical layers in the disks. That's all going to be important for when we try to, to estimate the, the chemical composition of planets. Um, but I want to uh, leave the chemistry to, to the side for a moment and just think about the gas uh, as such. So observationally, uh, we have pretty clear evidence for that the gas and the dust are doing different things. Uh, when it comes to dust, we have a very good probe of that. So the thermal emission from dust uh, is uh, quite readily detected uh, at, at millimeter wavelengths. Uh, and for the gas, we can't actually trace the main uh, components of the gas, which is molecular hydrogen. For instance, CO uh, is typically used to, to figure out what the gas uh, is up to. And what you see here are uh, millimeter uh, wavelength um, observations of the dust in the lower panel and then of CO in the upper panel. And there are a few things to, that should immediately stand out to you. One is that the dust is much more structured. Uh, than the gases. So it seems like we have sort of sharper features in the dust than we do uh, in the gas. The second is that the gas is much more widely distributed. Uh, so the, the dust um, observations really fit into a rather small part of where we, where we see, uh, see the gas. So this is part of this radial segregation that I already talked about. So this is all really interesting, um, but there is this big question mark if CO is actually a good probe of what the gas is doing. And this uh, comes down to very, gives, um, this leads to very fundamental questions of actually how much gas there, there even is uh, in these disks uh, if we feel any kind of uncertainty of using, in this case, 12 CO to probe the total uh, gas mass. So there's been multiple ideas of how you could weigh 
uh, disks, how I can measure uh, the gas mass. Uh, one of them is to simply use uh, the dust images, which uh, as you see, we can get pretty readily. Uh, we know how to convert uh, these thermal emission uh, figures or observations uh, into dust masses. And in the interstellar medium, there is a rather constant conversion factor, factor between the gas and the, and the dust. So you have about 100 times more gas than you have dust. So one way to get to this gas masses is just to multiply the inferred dust mass and you get your gas mass. Uh, there are some issues with this approach, though. Uh, one is that we're these are planet-forming disks, uh, which means that uh, potentially quite a lot of the solids uh, have been incorporated into boulders and planets already by the time we're in these disks. And uh, furthermore, uh, we don't know if all the gas that was originally there is, is there now. We might have had quite a lot of gas uh, evaporation, which uh, removes, uh, removes the gas. Uh, another way that uh, people have tried to get to the gas mass of these disks uh, is using an isotopologue of molecular hydrogen, that is HD. Uh, this uh, builds an assumption that the HD to molecular hydrogen uh, ratio is constant. There are potentially some issues with this just from an observational point of view. We know that HD just emits from a small part of the disk, so you need to convert from that mass to the whole disk mass. Uh, the deuterium fraction, fractionation chemistry will change the HD to molecular hydrogen ratio in disks potentially. But the biggest actually issue with this is that it's really difficult to observe HD. You need to have a space telescope that operates in the far infrared to do that. And currently uh, we don't, which makes it difficult to get more of these measurements. Uh, a third approach is to look at the disk structure uh, to infer gas mass. So the disk structure depends on disk dynamics, which depends on the total density structure of the disk, include, which is dominated by the gas, density, gas surface density. Uh, the, the potential issues with this, though, is that it's not really fully figured out how the substructure that you saw in the previous slide, how, that, um, how to take that into account when using sort of the overall global disk structure to infer gas masses. But this is definitely very, um, what, what I think might um, one of the two most promising avenues towards getting towards gas masses. The final one, and this is by far the most common one, is to use the CO, the kind of observations that we just looked at. Use the CO observations to get the CO mass, and then from the CO mass, get the gas mass. This then has the assumption that the CO to molecular hydrogen abundance is constant. Here, there are multiple issues. Um, CO can be destroyed and removed from the gas through multiple processes that we'll go through. Uh, and the only reason that we continue to use it is that it is observationally very accessible. And most of the other, uh, other ones are either not or have as many issues uh, with them. But that's, since CO is the most uh, common tracer of, of gas and gas mass and disks, um, it is important to understand its limitations. The first limitation is just an optical depth uh, issue. So this, the CO lines that are easy to observe, the strong CO lines, uh, they tend to get optically thick, pretty high up in the disk atmosphere, uh, which means that if you want to actually probe the full gas mass of, of the disk, you're going to need to combine different CO isotopologues to become optically thick at different, uh, different heights in the disk. This is something we can do, it's just a, just a complication. The second limitation is that, as I said, there are multiple processes that can change the CO to molecular hydrogen ratio in the disk. In interstellar medium, there's a relative simple CO formation chemistry. CO is not destroyed very readily. And you end up with a CO to molecular hydrogen ratio that's around 10 to the minus 4. In theory, uh, this ratio um, should persist in a sort of intermediate layer in the disk. Uh, we will see that this actually is, turns out to not be completely true. Uh, but 
assuming that for the moment, uh, there's only going to be like in the best case scenario, there's only going to be this intermediate layer where you can maintain this 10 to the minus four ratio because at higher diskites, you're exposed to UV photons, which destroy CO. And at lower disk height, it gets too cold and CO freezes out. But still, you can take this into account. You can take the optical depth of different CO traces into, into, account, uh, into account and start building a, a grid of models that you can then uh, compare with observations to measure their masses. So one example of that is, uh, is shown here. So what you're seeing is a grid of uh, calculated of, of theoretical gas, um, these gas masses uh, that have been run through ready to transfer kind of grid to estimate what their CO should, should look like. Sorry. Sorry about that. Whenever I need to talk for more than 10 minutes, I seem to always get some dust stuck in my throat. But I, I am back and we'll just take up where we left off. Uh, so we can run this grid of uh, disk models with different masses, see what uh, CR isotopolog emission they should have. It turns out that there's a pretty tight correlation that you should be able to use to infer to then back out disk masses if you have observations of multiple C isotopologs. But if you do this, uh, you get something that's quite puzzling. First of all, you get total disk gas masses that are fairly low compared to what you would expect from the solar system, tend to be below one Jupiter mass. Second, you get a gas to dust ratio that is considerably lower than what's seen in interstellar medium. So instead of a gas to dust ratio around 100, you often get one that's 10 or even, even one. So this, this is puzzling, but I mean, there are processes that could, um, could make this be true. You could be dispersing the gas and this disk. It could be that quite few disks actually have enough gas to, to form a Jupiter. But another, uh, another option is that the CO, CO is not, even in this intermediate layer, actually constant or 10 to the minus 4. And there are reason, theoretical reasons to suspect that this might be what's going on. Uh, there are ways to destroy CO also in this intermediate layer using either X-rays, uh, which uh, you can use to convert CO into hydrocarbons. And we do see quite a lot of hydrocarbons in these disks. Uh, but also, if you can have CO not so much freeze out on the grain, which only happens in the middle plane, but just spend a little bit of time on the surface of the grain, you can start converting CO into molecules like CO2, uh, which are much less volatile and can stay in the ice phase also in this intermediate layer. Uh, we also have observational um, data that suggests that it is, um, when we see these low gas masses inferred from CO, what we're seeing is actually not gas depletion, but CO depletion. Uh, one of the most compelling ones uh, are coming from HD observations uh, of TW Hydra. So HD was one of those other probes of the gas mass. And that uh, when you use HD in this case, you get the gas mass estimate that's or at least an order of magnitude higher than you get from CO. And that really suggests that what we're seeing when we see this low inferred gas masses is uh, depletion, uh, depletion of CO. So this means it's very difficult to, uh, to get gas masses from our existing observations. I would say there are at least three paths uh, forward to try to get around this. Uh, one is to build another far infrared uh, telescope in space and have a lot of observations of HD towards many disks. Uh, a second one is to work on the theory of how the structure and distribution uh, of uh, the dust uh, in, in the disks, uh, how that depends on the, on the gas and therefore uh, uh, use the, you know, the, the, where the pebbles are in the disks as an indicator of, of how much gas mass you have. This was the idea by Dana Powell. 
Um, and the third one is to use a combination of molecules that allow you to simultaneously determine how much of the CO has been converted into other species, as well as then the CO itself to get an idea what the gas mass uh, is really like. And these are all, um, like any one of these um, might give us uh, a big part of the answer, but I think you're really going to need a com combination of a couple of these to get us to a satisfactory place where we can say that we feel confident about what the gas masses of these disks are really like. Um, so gas mass is still something we're figuring out. How about gas structure? Is CO a reliable tracer of what the structure of the gas is like? Maybe. Uh, it depends on uh, whether we think that you will have a different, let's say, CO uh, chemistry in rings and in gaps uh, in disks. If you do not, and I think it's a reasonable assumption uh, to, to think that um, the CO chemistry doesn't change that much locally, you could at least use a CO and substructure in CO emission to say something about the depth and width of gas gaps compared to, to dust gaps. As this is work by Coco Zhang uh, showing uh, exactly this towards five disks. This is all coming out on maps, which I'll be talking more about uh, shortly. Uh, but one of the things that you can see is that it looks like the gas gaps are generally wider and shallower compared to, to the dust gaps. This is actually expected from uh, models of plant formation where these gaps are carved out uh, by plant formation. But there are also cases where it seems like we have uh, too little, like the, the, the gas gap is really too shallow to match up with what's coming out of plant formation models. So this is work that's just, I would say, getting started. And there's also the need for theoretical work to back up uh, the current assumption, which is that the CO depletion, it might um, change from disk to disk, or it might change over large distances in a disk, but it's not going to change from sort of gap to ring uh, in disks. Finally, uh, we, we do need to just keep in mind that the gas uh, is going to be dispersed. It can be dispersed. It will get, probably get dispersed before we, we uh, stop seeing the dust. Uh, there are multiple sort of possibilities of how you can get rid of gas in disks. Uh, one is, of course, that you accrete it onto the stars and the planets. Uh, so these are accretion disks with accretion flows in towards the central star. Uh, these are also plant forming disks, which means that you do expect to, to sweep up uh, some of the disk uh, gas into planetary envelopes. But overall, this seems to, to be too slow processes compared to the observed lifetimes of disks. And instead, what we think is the main dispersion mechanism uh, of gas in the disks uh, is that once the accretion rate becomes similar to the rate of, that you can photo evaporate uh, gas in the disks, you get a very fast outward moving photo evaporative wind that disperses uh, the gas in these disks. That is all that I want to say about the gas. And instead, I want to switch over and talk about the composition uh, of these planets, the chemical uh, composition, and how that sort of in why we're interested in it and how that interacts in different way also with the dynamics and the structure uh, of, of the disk. There are several reasons that uh, one should care about the chemistry and the composition of these disks. Uh, one of them is that um, molecules of different kinds, we've already seen that, uh, are key to trace the structure, the gas structure of these disks. So, and there are other gas properties that you can only get through understanding chemistry as well. Uh, these include things like ionization, uh, a very important factor in, in planet formation. Um, but the chemistry is also important uh, if you just want to understand the compositions of forming planets. If you are interested in planets uh, like Earth and why it became a living planet and perhaps how many other ones like this there might exist out there, well, then we need to think about uh, what is the organic and 
uh, what it comes to the, how much organics do you have in these disks? How much water do you have in these disks? The kind of molecules that we think are important for organs of life. And it turns out that an Earth-like planet can actually um, <clears throat> sort of source uh, these kind of molecules uh, from quite a large uh, part of these disks. Uh, so plants like Earth, they form pretty close uh, to the star interior of the water snow line. But that doesn't mean they form comp from completely dry material. So we've already talked about how pebbles can drift inward uh, in the disk. And some of these pebbles might be able to store some water and organics from further out in the disk and therefore be somewhat wet. Um, they can also absorb uh, some uh, water from the gas phase uh, to form uh, basically mineralized uh, water. Uh, and so in the building blocks itself, uh, you can incorporate the sort of the solid building blocks itself. You can incorporate it, some volatiles, some organics, also if you're inside of the water snow line. A second place where a plant like Earth gets volatiles, including organics, is from the gas phase. So whatever is in the gas around 1 AU, uh, a planet like the Earth can uh, start to sweep up, forming a primary atmosphere. In the case of Earth, we lost most of this atmosphere, um, but that's not necessarily true for exoplanets. And then there is uh, a final way to, to get uh, volatiles, including organic organics, which is through impacts of different kinds. And these uh, impactors can come from anywhere in the disk. Uh, in our case, the, probably most of them came from so the inner part of the disk, let's say up to 3 AU or so. Uh, but we comets form considerably further out, and we think we had quite a few of those as well. And maybe those are actually responsible for bringing more organics to the Earth than um, meteor, like asteroid-like uh, impactors did. Also, if you want to understand the overall composition of a solar system or exoplanetary system, uh, that is also a case where we need to understand the chemical composition uh, of, of a disk. Uh, one of the tools that uh, we have been thinking about for some time to understand planet, the compositions of nascent planets is that of a sequence of snow lines uh, in disks. Uh, so what you're, if you're thinking about the disk now just in sort of one dimension, going from the inner hot region to the outer cold, uh, you will sort of step through multiple transition regions where certain volatile goes from being primarily in the gas to being primarily uh, frozen out. Uh, close to the star, you'll have things like water and methanol freezing out. Further out, you'll get things like CO2, methane, CO, and N2, and, and so on. Uh, this means that you get a different molecular composition in any planet that's forming as you form at different radii. You'll also have a different uh, elemental uh, composition. And you'd get a different elemental composition in the solids than the gas, because at each time you cross the snow line, you end up moving, uh, in this case, carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen from the, from the gas in, into, into the solids. And if you're looking at the, the solid composition as, as you step outward, uh, you, will, you will have a pretty uh, if we, in this case, normalized with respect to sulfur, which is fairly refractory element, you'll have a low oxygen, carbon, and nitrogen to sulfur ratio as you are far in, uh, in the solar system. And then this uh, ratio will increase in a stepwise fashion as you go outward. As you can see, it doesn't, um, the steps are not the same for nitrogen, carbon, and oxygen. Uh, so you will also have an increase in carbon to oxygen ratio as you go outward and an increasing nitrogen to carbon to oxygen ratio uh, as you go outward. And you can uh, use these elemental ratios both in the, in the solids and in the gas uh, to try to figure out what your planet or comet composition is. And we'll come back to this later, but here I just want to mention what I think is one uh, sort of fun application of this uh, how, and how these uh, elemental ratios interact with uh, dynamics, which uh, is recent work by, by Ellen Price, who thought about what will be the composition of grains if you combine, if you just think about water and CO, so two of these species, 
and just think about their sublimation and their freeze out on the one hand. And then the fact that brains and pebbles can drift uh, inward in, in disks. What you get is uh, that as, the, as you let this disk sit and, and more and more pebbles deplete, is that you deplete uh, the outer disk of large pebbles. And therefore, the pebbles, they carry most of the, of the mass in these disks. So they will basically take all the water ice and just transport it inward, which means that you, uh, you lose all your water ice from the outermost part uh, of, of the disk. Uh, and that's what's uh, because you're losing, you're, you're losing uh, the pebbles. Now, when these pebbles uh, drift inward, they will also carry with them uh, the CO ice. But the CO will pretty soon hit a sublimation front where all that ice, before it gets drifted too far in towards, the, in towards the star, it will sublimate. And then uh, it can diffuse back out and just freeze out on whatever solids are left. And these are typically like these tiny solids that do not drift. And because of that, um, you don't get the kind of uh, depletion of CO as you get for water, but you actually manage to maintain quite a lot of solid water in the outer part of the disk. And this can give you very high CO to water ice ratio in bodies that form in the furthest part of the solar system. Uh, perhaps explaining some of the weird comets that we've been seeing, both from uh, inside of our solar system, but also uh, interstellar comets that have this very high uh, CO to water uh, ratio. Uh, snow lines do more than just affect the composition uh, compositions of planets. Uh, they also uh, can affect how efficiently planets form and therefore whether you end up getting a terrestrial type planet, which we in, in our solar system only see in, inside of the water snow line, uh, or uh, Jupiter sized planets, which we see um, seems to be happening only outside of the water snow line in our case. So established that it's important to understand the chemical composition uh, of protoplanetary disks. Uh, now I'm going to add one more complication to this interlinkage, uh, inter, like, yeah, the links between uh, chemistry structure and dynamics, which is that of history. So the chemistry that we see in disks is not set by disk processes, but by disk chemical processes alone, uh, but something that starts or then when, when a star begins to form in molecular clouds. So to understand the chemical composition of disks, we actually need to back up and look at how a solar type star forms and then how the chemistry evolves through these different steps. So a solar type uh, star forms through the collapse of a molecular cloud into a protostar, disperse, you accrete and disperse a gas and dust and you're left with a protoplanetary disk. Let's start with a cloud phase and what kind of chemistry goes on there that can become uh, important for the chemical composition that's present during plant formation. Um, in clouds, some of the typical things we see, that we see there is ice formation. This is where things like water forms, CO forms, CO2, N2, basically all the major carriers of carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen, uh, that's already set uh, in molecular clouds. Within molecular clouds themselves, we see uh, a sequence of ice formation. If we look at ice spectra taken at different distances from the densest parts of the cores, uh, in particular, we see water forming pretty early on, and then we see a lot of CO and CO2 ice forming as it gets closer in towards the, the central uh, core. Uh, this um, we think we can explain by um, looking at so-called uh, PDR or mm -hmm. photon uh, dissociation or photon dominated regions. Uh, so if you look at the, <coughs> sorry, if you look at the, the edge uh, of a cloud, um, what you have is really competition of processes between photodissociation from UV photons coming in on the, uh, from the left, on the one hand, 
And then gas phase and green surface formation of molecules on the other. So it's competition between these two. Uh, and what sets the which become the main carriers of carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen is the relative efficiency of different uh, chemical processes. And it turns out that in the conversion of carbon into Cl is very efficient. So that's where most of the carbon ends up. Conversion of oxygen into water on cranes, very efficient. So that's where most of the oxygen ends up, that is in the Cl. And the conversion of nitrogen into N2, we think is very uh, efficient, though that one turns out to be very difficult to study directly. So, but by the end of the cloud stage, we think we know at least some of where the carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen is. And that's what's shown here. So oxygen, silicate, CL, and water, this gray region that's shown might also be water, but it's difficult to observe uh, for different reasons. This, the carbon is basically in CO and in refractories. Uh, and the nitrogen, well, we don't see about three quarters of the nitrogen, but we think that it's mostly, mostly N2. This, um, these reservoirs of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, we think generally survives from their formation in the cloud stage all the way into plant, to plant formation. One of the ways that we know that is by looking at the D2H ratio in water in solar system objects. It is too high generally to, for this water to have formed through this chemistry, from which we infer that they come all the way from this molecular cloud phase. So if we're thinking about the major reservoirs of carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen here symbolized by water, uh, we need to think back all the, all the way to this, these clouds. There's also very recent evidence that we inherit not just these major reservoirs, but also simple organics all the way from, from this phase. There's a recent observation on methanol that's found in a disk, actually on two different disks that are too warm for in situ methanol production. Methanol forms mainly from CO ice. Uh, and based on this, we think that we're seeing is really inherited methanol from this cloud stage. So we can add uh, that also things like methanol must come from very early on in the star formation uh, process. Once we get to the protostellar phase, uh, we access some new uh, formation channels because these are warmer. Uh, so if we think about especially the grains, if we're far away from the protostar, uh, the only thing that can really happen to the icy mantles that we built up in the cloud stage is that they get dissociated by different kinds of radiation. But as we start getting closer to the protostar and our 30 Kelvin or so, uh, things start to move in the ice and can start to recombine into larger molecules. And we see the effects of this chemistry when the, the, these icy grains get very close uh, to the protostar when there are different ways that they can uh, sublimate, these ices can sublimate. And the ways that we see it is that we see this incredibly complex uh, spectra. So this is adapted from Jess Jorgensen's survey of one of these protostars. I mean, this is tons of these very complex organic molecules floating around. Many of them, or like most of them, uh, are oxygen rich. So there are things like ethanol, uh, methanol, those kind of molecules would be typical for, for this stage. Uh, some of these molecules uh, probably survive as well, which means that by the time we get to the disk phase, we have this reservoir of all these more complex organic molecules that are already embedded in the starting conditions of these uh, protoplanetary, protoplanetary disks. And then we get to the disk. And here, we have already looked at this cartoon uh, once, but now uh, just take everything that I said before about this, these links between the chemistry, the structure, and the, uh, and the dynamics, and then that add on that we already start with this rather complex composition uh, of oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon-bearing species, as well as you know, sulfur and phosphorus-bearing ones as well, but we know less, less of those. So how do you try to, how do you start to disentangle all these different processes, figure out how much is inherited, how much uh, additional chemistry we actually have in disks? 
Well, the main way that we have been doing that, and therefore what I want to focus on, is using Alma. So Alma is amazing, and it allows us to map out what the chemistry is like in these disks. Uh, we already saw some observations of CL, but here I just want to emphasize what it is that we actually do uh, with Alma to make the kind of images that I'll be uh, showing you. Uh, so if you want to make a map of dust in disk, you want to know what the thermal emission is like, so you want you know, broadband kind of observations of these disks at millimeter. Uh, and this means you also have a lot of photons. So you can go in at very high resolution and get these beautiful, beautiful structures. If you want to observe the chemistry in these disks, well, then you need to isolate the photons that come from some particular spectral line and make an image that's just those photons. And that's what's shown here for one molecule from aldehyde on the same scales uh, as the dust that's that's to the to the left. So we recently uh, undertook a project with uh, Alma to uh, to try to dig into this problem of imaging the chemistry in, in disks at high resolutions so down to 0.1 arc seconds. And that's what I want to spend the rest of this lecture just going over some of the things we're learning about the chemistry of, of this based on, on this program. The first is, and this is not from this program alone by any means, is that we don't actually see, uh, we see some organic molecules in disks, but not that many. But among the ones we see, uh, they tend to be oxygen poor. So in these images, oxygen is red, uh, carbon is gray, nitrogen is yellow, and sulfur, or, sorry, nitrogen is blue, and sulfur is yellow. Uh, they tend to be oxygen poor, and these uh, nitrogen bearing molecules are all nitriles or isonitriles. Uh, this is very interesting if we're going back to our first sort of motivation, uh, why we might care about the chemical composition of these disks is to understand the organic chemistry within which plants form. Because these so-called nitriles are heavily implicated in at least one ordinance of life scenario for life here on Earth. Where if you combine nitriles with UV light, uh, it's actually, you, you quite readily get all the building blocks of the molecules of life that all life is using uh, here on Earth. So we are particularly interested in these nitriles. And one of the things uh, that we got out of maps um, was um, maps uh, of uh, hydrogen cyanide as well as other nitriles uh, in these disks. And what you can see is that these are very structured. Uh, we see um, a lot of wiggles. If you look at the radial profiles, you know, each uh, wiggle up is a ring and each downward wiggle here is a gap because these aren't logarithmic uh, scales. Um, so that, that means that as you go across a disk, you are going to get have different kinds of access to these nitriles. But perhaps the most interesting part is that when you look at the inner 50 AU of these disks, which are the ones that should be most relevant for plant formation, we have overall a pretty high nitrile abundance. So this is showing the the estimated uh, hydrogen cyanide uh, abundance compared to water uh, in percent. And what you see that in four out of five disks, we have somewhere between you know, a few tenths of a percent to a percent in these, these disks. This is exactly where comets are in our solar system. So suggesting that the, the kind of organic composition we have in these disks is actually not too different uh, to what we saw uh, in what was present in our, our solar system. We also do see, and uh, this has been known from before, that there are more complex organic molecules around, especially in nitriles, uh, complex nitriles. Uh, we think these form uh, in situ in the disks. We have pretty good evidence that they do, uh, which means that we're now adding another sort of layer of chemistry on top of the inherited one. Uh, we also see that some of these complex nitri nitriles, especially this acetonitrile or methyl cyanide, has two names, um, emits from rather close to the midplane, which suggests that whatever of this molecule is being formed is accessible to the any forming uh, plant. So if we're going to sort of finish our, st our story of how the chemistry develops uh, from the molecular cloud to the, to the disk phase, 
Yeah, it is that in addition to all this inherited chemistry, the disc is active and it adds on this layer of uh, nitrile uh, or complex nitrile chemistry or oxygen poor or reduced, whatever you want to call it, chemistry uh, that might be very important for, uh, for feeding young planets with the building blocks of life. But this is not the only thing we can use uh, chemistry or like our chemical understanding and maps of um, of molecules in this disk for. So in the final few minutes, uh, I want to just go through some of the other things we can do when you do have these, these maps of, of molecules. So the first one is to try to understand uh, what is the relationship between substructure in dust and substructure in molecules or in chemistry. So these are all dust maps. And you see this beautiful uh, rings, rings and gaps. Uh, we also see rings and gaps when we look at specific molecules, which is what's uh, shown here, but now at a larger scale. And one of the things we would like to understand is what is the origin of these rings and gaps? Uh, we see if we look within a single disk and we look at different molecules, we seem to see a different disk or different set of substructures in, in each molecule, which, which is curious. So this is one disk, five molecules. So you see anything from sort of rather continuous smooth profile to four uh, different rings. If we look between disks uh, in a single molecule, and this is again hydrogen cyanide, we see again five different kinds of structures. This suggests that the structure of individual molecules is tied, um, is tied in some particular way to the local environment uh, of each disk. Uh, this is maybe seen, uh, so, so on the one hand, we see this like great uh, diversity of, of structures both within and between, uh, within disks and between disks. But we are also seeing some patterns emerging. So I'm just going to show you for a single, a single disk. So this is HD163296. And the background is a dust structure. And then you see uh, the chemical gaps are rings, and the chemical rings are, are squares. And we do see some lining up, right, of the structure of different, uh, of different molecules. Uh, but what is peculiar is that sometimes we get a chemical ring that's lined up with the dust gap. Sometimes we get uh, chemical rings that are lined up with dust rings. Uh, sometimes we get chemical gaps that are lined up with dust gaps. We basically have all permutations are, are possible. And we're still trying to figure out what is causing these different sort of structural alignments. But I think we can say for sure that the uh, that all dust gaps are not the same in terms of their gas. Because uh, if they were, then we should not see uh, these different kinds of alignments that sometimes you have a dust gap that coincides with a chemical gap, sometimes with a chemical ring. Uh, perhaps um, this can be used to, uh, to better constrain whether a gap is carved out by a planet or not, or if the gap is carved out with a planet, what kind of planet, which I think is one very interesting uh, direction. A second thing that we can start to, to address is what the elemental ratios are in these disks. This is something we already mentioned when talking about the origins of, of um, the compositions of different kinds of solar system uh, objects. And now I just want to add some observational constraints to what these, uh, these are. So I want to start with showing you just a theoretical framework. And this is similar to what I showed you before when we talked about the different elemental ratios. But now instead of showing everything with respect to sulfur, I'm just showing the C over O ratio and the N over O ratio in, in the disk model. And what you see, and but here in both in the gas and the solid. So the thicker line solid, thinner line is the gas. Uh, and what you see if you now focus on the gas and in the C over O ratio is that as you go out further in the disk, your C over O ratio in the gas increases. And it increases uh, as you cross the water slow line because you're moving oxygen into, into the solids. Uh, it increases again as you cross the, the CO2 snow line when the only thing that's left in the gas phase pretty much is CO, which gives you a C over O ratio of, of one. But you can't really get above a C over O ratio of one with this kind of snow line model of what sets the elemental ratio 
It is then very curious uh, what I'm going to show you next, which comes from analyzing the relative abundances of CO and of C2H, this hydrocarbon in the, in the disk. You can think about that the C2H only has carbon, CO has both carbon and oxygen, so the ratio should be sensitive to the CRO ratio. And if we analyze what their relative abundances are, what we infer is that you, in large swaths of disks, you ha have a C over O ratio that is higher than unity. So as shown in this figure is, on the one hand, you have the observations of the, this molecule C2H in, in gray, uh, and then you have the model predictions for different C over O ratios. Um, and in particular, the red, reddish orange line, that's where you see overall ratio of one. And you see that does not, in most of the disk, allow you to reproduce observations. Instead, what you need uh, is something like a carbon to oxygen ratio of two, which you cannot get if CO is your main carrier of, of carbon in, in, the, in these disks. So there's, there's something going on here where we have an additional source of carbon in the gas phase that is strongly affecting the gas composition, which we can see here observationally. Um, and that's going to affect potentially the gas composition of whatever gas is being accreted by planets as well. So this is, I think, a very interesting uh, result. The final thing I want to talk about is how you can contain the vertical structure uh, in, in disks. And here's this vertical chemical structure, but I'm actually going to most to talk about the vertical uh, gas structure, again, assuming that CO is a decent probe of what the gas uh, is doing. So, so far, I've been showing you these sort of maps uh, of, of molecules, but the actual data product is a bit more complicated. It looks like this, so-called channel maps, where at each velocity you get, you get an image. Uh, because these disks are Keplerian, you get a very particular image where if you're in the far from the line center, you get this very uh, concentrated uh, emission that emits close to the star. And if you are close to the line set center, well, you're, now you're seeing emission that has basically zero relative velocity uh, to the, uh, if you have um, subtracted the velocity of the, of the star itself, and you see a lot of material that's uh, further out in the disk, as well as things that are close to the center that is neither, from our point of view, rotating away or, or towards us. But the main thing I want to focus on is that at this high resolution, you can start seeing emission that's coming both from the front and from the, from the back of the disk. And you can see that there is uh, a gap in between, that there is um, a, vertical, a, a vertical structure. Um, <coughs> excuse me. This is maybe uh, seen here uh, a little bit better, where we have five disks and we have three uh, CO isotopologues, and just looking at the single channel, and you can really start seeing that there there is this uh, projection. You can see two different sides of the disks. And if you look at the single disk, we can look at how the different CO isotopologues. Uh, how they are um, distributed uh, height-wise. Here you can already see it looks like they are sort of collapsing as you go from the uh, more abundant to the less abundant isotopologue. And we can use this to start mapping out what the structure of the, the vertical structure of these disks are. Uh, the 12 CO uh, extends far and is emitting from high up in the disk. 13 CO from deeper in and C8 and now from very close to the midplane, just because of their different abundances and therefore different optical depth. If we assume that these are optically thick lines, and this is generally a good assumption, we can then use the brightness of these lines to say something about the temperature uh, of the disk at, at different heights and, and radii. Uh, this is something we have done for, for all the disks. And as you ex would expect, the disks are warmer, higher up, and towards the center. They're also warmer towards the brighter stars, which are the two that are shown in the bottom uh, row. Uh, 
But the main thing I want to just drive home is that we are now at the point where we can really get empirical constraints of um, what the temperature structure uh, are of disks, what the density structures are, uh, and also we can do this for different molecules to get constraints on where different molecules are in disks. And that's where I want to wrap up. Uh, the things that we have talked about is that uh, gas structures and masses are really important for plant formation and unfortunately quite difficult to get to observationally. Uh, and the development of more reliable probes of these is one of the main, I would say, goals of, of my community. Um, the chemical environments within which planets form uh, are shaped by a combination of interstellar medium processes, protostellar processes, and disk processes. And you need to understand all three if you want to be able to predict what are the major carriers of different elements and therefore which snow lines matter, what's the organic chemistry, and so on. We do, excitingly enough, we do find that the, the organic molecules that are currently sort of the hottest one in organs of life chemistry, things like hydrogen cyanide, they're abundant. Uh, in, in disks uh, when we look at them in, in detail around other stars. But where I want to end is where I end with the last slide, which is that whether or not you care about the details of the chemistry, I think if you, if you care about the compositions of planets, you probably do, but uh, if you're instead interested in things like plant formation efficiencies, uh, well, for most kind of gas properties, you are going to have to have some chemical understanding to be able to derive those observationally. So whether you're interested in the structures, dynamics, ionization, or elemental ratios, this, this information uh, observationally is all encoded in the abundances and distributions of molecules. And uh, because of the links that exist between chemistry, structure, and dynamics, you kind of need to understand all three to be able to fully use that information. And with that, I'm going to wrap up. I look forward to, to seeing you at the conference. And until then, uh, take care.